when we hear the phrase, the second coming of Christ, what comes into our minds? Perhaps it is a fear that accompanies judgment. Or perhaps it's the mindless dating of the end of the world by pompous, self-appointed prophets. Maybe it's the image of tanks lumbering across the border from Turkey into Syria. Or it might even be just a sigh wondering about all the perplexities of life. After all, is all this important to us? But let me add something else that we might be wondering. What about the certainty of God's ownership of the earth and of time and of all eternity? The scripture is clear. The sentence God began in creation will finally and forever be closed with a period, with a full stop. History's march forward will finally stop. The circling of moons around the planets and planets around the suns will come to a complete end. That which we have known in this world's existence will come to an end. The barn door will be shut. And that doesn't mean that God can't make a new barn and even make open and open a new door. But that which we know at the moment will no longer be. The religions of the world have been divided into two major categories. There are the world-denying religions that insist that this present world does not matter. We are best to renounce it, ignore it, and look forward to a better world to come. In contrast, there are the world-affirming religions that see unlimited potential with the present world and that approach life in terms of optimism and possibility. So where does our Christian faith fit? We are surely both at times and neither at times, but mostly we are neither, not seeking to deny or to affirm the world, but to transform it. We believe that life on planet Earth is going somewhere and that time in the hand of God is moving us along the way. And all of us, we are not unacquainted with endings. All too well, every single one of us knows of the anguish of a friendship ended or a marriage finished, broken up, or a career that comes to a sudden stop. All ended too soon. And these endings resonate with the final endings. In today's text, which Catherine is going to read in a moment or two, Jesus speaks of both kinds of endings, those present and that yet to come. He confronts those who adore the beauty and sacredness of the temple. As for these things that you see, the days will come, Jesus said, when not one stone will be left upon another and all will be thrown down. That which you so honour today will someday come to nothing. I don't know, do we all feel the sense or feel the anguish? The temple that housed the heartfelt worship of Israel for so long will come to an end. Yet the same is true for every form of faith that attempts to confine and define the nature and the work of God. Our temples are doomed too. Think about our own places understood to be holy because in our history we have met God in these places. Churches, human relationships, families, hopes and dreams, callings, all these will shortly come to an end. 
Perhaps their ending will come as a result of the forces of the world that rise up against them, or, or as our own deaths force the generations to move ahead. Perhaps they will die because we have not tended them very well, thinking that they were forever and could fend for themselves without love and without nurture. Perhaps they die because they have moved away from the direction to which they originally pointed. What had been a tent in the wilderness, open and refreshing, robust yet intimate and changing, had become a solid, unchanging chunk of wood, a place of hallowed memories, but a solid place devoid of the life-giving spirit and all such temples deprived of the Holy Spirit are doomed to die. But all is not doom and gloom. There is hope for tomorrow's renewal. These endings can be seen as opportunity for the beginning of new faith. Out of the ashes of our hurtful past come the explicit hope born of divine love. Whether church or family, career or calling, whatever comes tumbling down, a new day in Christ will always dawn. Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 21 to those whose temple is coming down, do not be led astray in verse 8. But in fact, let's read that passage from Luke's Gospel. Will Catherine come and read it for us? the destruction of the temple and signs of the end times. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? <coughs> he replied, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. Thank you, Catherine. Let me just repeat these last words. Stand firm and you will win life. Just before Catherine read the, uh, uh, we, uh, verse 8, it says, do not be led astray. And that means don't be taken in by the forces of evil around you. He also said, don't be terrified. And that means don't be given over to despair. He also said, do not prepare your defense in advance in verse 14. And that means be open 
to the new things that God is doing. He also said, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. And that is, you are to trust. And that means you and it means me that you are absolutely to trust in God. Also, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. And that means that your tenacious faith, uncompromising, will guarantee your future. And herein lies our hope for tomorrow. But that hope is not for everyone. It is only for all those courageous believers who move beyond the fallen temples and into the new day. Our proclamation is your opportunity to testify, he calls it, is of a living and vital experience with God in Christ. And all these things come in the midst of the terror of life. The earthly temples despite our desire to cling, must be moved beyond. And then comes the opportunity to bear witness for you and I to bear witness to the whole world. Salvation, that is biblical salvation, regards every aspect of life, personal and public, individual and social. Salvation is a healing wholeness it is a deliverance from those powers, political and spiritual, that prevents abundant life, a life of full, joyous communion with God, and as importantly, or nearly as importantly, with one another. Salvation is peace, or to use the Jewish word, shalom. It is a deliverance from death and enslavement to the law. It is a deliverance from guilt and despair. But salvation is also primarily rooted in our daily living reality. It's not just about reservations in the sweet by and by, and it is the work of God. God alone brings peace, shalom, salvation in Jesus, in his life and teachings, in his death and resurrection, Jesus is saving all of us from ourselves and from our sin. And here the endings, both present and future, find their meaning. What God began, God will bring to its ultimate fullness. And you and I, we are all part of it. This blessed hope signals God's direction for the world. It declares that history will be brought to its rightful conclusion in God's own time, in God's own way. Some people talk about the doctrine of the end times, and we may well miss the meaning of it unless we define end as a goal to be reached, but not a goal that is to be reached, that has been reached. What God began in creation and has guided throughout history in all the fields of endeavor, education, politics, justice, and morality, all this comes eventually together as God completes that which God began. And in God, my sermon was entitled Hope Fulfilled. And in God, and in the end times, that hope is truly f fulfilled, and it's fulfilled in God's time. Amen, and may God add his blessing to these thoughts based on his most holy word.